My name is Muta Bill. Most people know me as Napoleon, a former member of the Tupac Outlaws. In my short life, man, I experienced a lot of things out there. Flown on private jets, albums that sold over 40 million copies worldwide, shootouts, street fights, club fights, whatever you name it, been there, done that. Man, I experienced the ups and downs of this fast life. So I want to share with you my story. This Napoleon, life of an outlaw. I was three years old when my mother and father got murdered. After the murder of my parents, me and my brothers, we was in the house with, my, with the dead bodies for 24 hours. And I remember as a kid that I was biting my mother, trying to wake her up. I grew up in the house of my grandparents after the death of my mother and father. So whatever I would see out on the block, drug dealing or whatever, I would go in my room and I would write a song out of it. You know, It was a way for me to relieve whatever was inside of me, I was able to put it on paper. All, all I can remember all his life, he loved rapping. And I remember the first time I met Pop Man, he asked me to rhyme for him. I rhymed for him, we hit it off, and the rest is history. When he got close with Pop, he looked at Pop like a big brother or a father figure, you know, someone to look up to. Muta was, um, him and Pop were bonded real tough. I think Muta had become one of Tupac's extended family members. Hey tonight. Death Row was a very fast life, man. Parties every night, private jets. We was living like kings. There was a there was a certain amount of arrogance they all had during that time because they were on cloud nine. But I never expected to end that type of life. I never expected that that life would come to an end so drastically and so soon. There'll be some stuff you're gonna see that's gonna make it hard to smile in the future. Yasmin called Gaddafi mother and said Tupac just got shot. I couldn't believe it, you know what I mean? And you know, but the first thing that I said in my head, well he got shot five times before, he's gonna he's gonna take this, come out, do records, sell millions of records again. But when I actually saw him in a hospital bed, to me, it, I knew for right there that it didn't look like he was gonna make it. You know, and Pac loved him and them two was bonding, so I know it, it affected him real, real hard. Once again, Tupac Shakur dead at the age of 25. 25, 25. It was a time when I was in the music industry and I had three houses at one time. Money was coming in, but I didn't have much in the happiness, you know what I mean? I didn't have happiness inside of me. So I knew that it had to be something else out there that could bring happiness besides money, jewelry, cars, and fame. Because once you get to a certain level, you start searching. And what I did is I turned to experiment different drugs, and I turned to drinking alcohol real heavy. He was always liquored up. He was always liquored up and smoking weed. I seen him wild out with the girls, wild out drinking alcohol, getting drunk, fighting. And I happened to one day be in a recording studio and I was very intoxicated. And I got into a fight with my little brother and it got to the point where I almost probably killed my little brother. I hurt him so much that he had to go to the hospital and get staples in his head. And it happened to be a Muslim brother who was in the parking lot and he broke the fight up. He calmed me down. He came and spoke to me. I said, imagine tomorrow waking up sober and realizing that you killed your brother. How would you feel about that? He always asked me to come to the Majid and for a while I was ignoring him. And when I first went up there, I remember I went up there deep, about 20 or 30 boys with me. And I, I went there expecting that it's just going to be like how I roll everywhere else with a posse or crew and we just going to hang out. But when I went there, that's when I seen something different that basically inclined me towards to want to know more about what these people was upon. That's what changed my life ever since then.
He, he got an awakening. Islam has given Muta a purpose. Overall, man, my brother, he's, he's a different person now, man. I think Napoleon is, is, has changed in a way where it's, it's, it's beneficial to the children, beneficial to himself, to his family, and to his friends. So when I looked at him, he definitely inspired me to want to, you know, give back to the youth and give back to the community in a way, you know, saying that, that, that Islam only offers you. He had a lot of potential, but he also had a lot of anger and unresolved issues that I think Islam probably gave him solace and peace. Muta is a good brother and I, um, personally I'm striving to be more like him. Napoleon, may Allah reward you, bro. You're a good dude, you're ahead of your time, you're a leader and a sign for all of us. And, you know, I'm a rival to the world's for law. Where is your little homie, your little know, big H rider, Islam Lincoln. I'm here to basically get some counts on my life, my background, street life, music industry, and what made me leave that lifestyle and accepted the religion of Islam. I was born in North New Jersey to two converts' parents. Both of my parents, alhamdulillah, they accepted the religion of Islam. When I was three years old, my mother and father, they got murdered in front of me. I also got shot in the foot during the killing of my parents. The people that murdered my mother and father, they was very close to me and my family. One of them was actually the person that gave me my name, Mutah. He was actually was my so-called godfather that we used to have in Jahiliya. After the death of my parents, me and my brothers, we moved in a home with my grandparents. They was nice enough to let us in their house, to raise us, etc. The neighborhood that my grandparents lived in was a neighborhood, it was, it was basically infested by criminal activities and drug activities such as drug dealing, stolen cars, shootouts, whatever you can imagine that happens in the neighborhoods of the ghettos in America. My grandmother, they lived in them type of neighborhoods. So at a very young age, my brothers and my cousins, they became the forerunners of the drug dealing in that neighborhood. And I remember the first time that I tried to follow them in their footsteps. The first day that I went outside on the block trying to sell drugs, I got arrested. I was about 12 years old. The police called my grandparents. They took me from the prison. I got in big trouble and I told myself that I would never ever do that again. And I started to write raps, poetry. Whatever I would see outside on my block, I would go into the room, I would make a song out of it, I would come back and I would rap it to the drug dealers, etc. I had a childhood friend by the name of Yafeo. Years went past and we lost contact with each other. And I happened to run into his mother and I asked his mother, how was he doing? His mom told me that he's also trying to pursue a career in the music industry. And she said, in fact, he lived with his brother by the name of Tupac Shakur. She said, Yafeo and Tupac, they're on their way to New York City. Why don't you go over there, get acquainted with an old friend, and if you want to get into the music industry, this is your opportunity to speak to Tupac, explain to him, etc. The part of New York that Tupac was visiting was about 30 minutes away from my home. It was a 30, 40 minute ride from Manhattan, from New Jersey. So I was able to hop on the train. I went over there, got acquainted with an old friend, and I was able to rap for Tupac, and that's how I got into the music industry. Before I got into the music industry, I was looking for a way to escape the life of criminal activities that I was facing in my neighborhood. Not knowing that as soon as I got into the music industry, that same type of lifestyle that I was running for, was running from, was basically a hundred times worse in the music industry. And at this time, I started to get successful being with Tupac. The first record that I ever performed on, it sold three million records worldwide. So I started to accumulate a little money. But as soon as everything was moving fast, one day Tupac was in the car with Shug Knight, another car pulled up on the side of him, they opened fire, they shot Tupac 13 times, he died six days later in the hospital. Myself and the rest of the outlaws, we went back to New Jersey. When I went to New Jersey, I got arrested, and I told myself once I get out of the cell, I'ma leave New Jersey, I'ma grab Gaddafi, 
y'all fail, and I'm gonna have them leave. I'm gonna have them leave New Jersey with me. Not to mention, I forgot to mention that the name of the group that Tupac put together was a group called the Outlaws. And the names that he chose for us was basically enemies of the West or so-called tyrants of the world. For example, Yafeo, Tupac gave him the name Gaddafi after the Libyan president, Mamor Gaddafi. Another member of the outlaw, Tupac gave him the name Hussein after the former Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein. Another member was called Idi Amin after the Ugandan president, Idi Amin. Another member of the outlaw, Tupac gave him the name Castro after the Cuban president, Fidel Castro. When I was very young, I had a very bad temper to the point that my Puerto Rican and Cuban side of my family, my African-American side of the family, they always blame my attitude and my temper on my mother's side of the family. But when I met Tupac, he had a joke. He said, the reason why I was very angry and upset was because of my height. He said, I had the short man complex. Other word is called the Napoleonic complex, named after the French emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. So that's how I got the name Napoleon. So after the death of Tupac, when I got to New Jersey, I decided to leave New Jersey. I told Gaddafi he should leave New Jersey with me. Gaddafi decided to stay in New Jersey. I left New Jersey in October. Tupac died in September. I get a phone call in November that Gaddafi just got shot. When I asked the person who shot Gaddafi, she said it was Napoleon, it was your little cousin. So basically, within one year, I witnessed my grandmother pass away. Tupac died, Gaddafi died. After the death of people that was very close to me, I started to turn to drugs to escape the memories or escape the pressure that I was under. And right at the same time when I turned to being addicted to drugs, etc., I also became very successful in the music industry. At this time of my life, I had three brand new houses. Cars, jewelry, money, everything you can imagine that you want from this dunya, I was able to have it at the reach of my hand. But every single night that I went to sleep, when lie, I was depressed. Even though I had hundreds of thousands in my bank account, even though I had brand new cars, 80,000 cars, 100,000 dollar cars, even though I had three brand new houses, every single day I laid my head down, I was depressed. Now many young people, unfortunately, they believe that if you have money, you have jewelry, you have cars, that's the ultimate happiness. And if that was true, then how come you have millionaires committing suicide? So when I got to this point in my life, man, I started to say, what can I do to bring, my, bring myself some type of happiness? So one of the things I turned to was trying to numb this situation. I turned to drugs. And I noticed that turning to drugs was only a temporary help to what I was going through. Because no matter what drug you use, eventually you have to leave your system. You're going to get sober. And the same problems that you're facing in your life is going to be with you. I didn't know which way to turn. And I remember at this point in my life, I used to pray to God. I wasn't a Muslim, even though my mother and father committed to the religion of Islam. But they was three years, I was three years old when they died, so I was raised upon the religion of Christianity. Growing up in my household, I knew that the religion of Christianity wasn't the proper way that teach you how to worship your Lord. So I said, I don't have no religion. But at this time of my life, I remember I used to pray to God. And I used to ask God, I used to say, I have money, I have jewelry, I have fame, everything that a man might want in his life. But the only thing that I, I would trade all this up to find some type of happiness in my heart. And I happened to one day be in the parking lot and I got into a fight with my little brother. My same little brother that was six months old when my mother and father got murdered in front of me. The same little brother that I vowed that I would protect. I got into a fight with my little brother. He had to go to the hospital to get staples in his head. But it happened to be a Muslim in that parking lot that day. A lot happened to put a Muslim in the scene that I was, that, when I heard my little brother that day. This Muslim came up to me, he calmed me down, he said some words to me, and he, had me, he made me start thinking for the first time. Eventually, he, he invited me to come to the mosque. After phone call, after phone call, I said, you know what? I never entered into a mosque in my life. I said, let me just go see what they have to offer. This guy, he won't stop calling me. He was very patient with me. I said, let me go see what he had to offer. I went to the mosque, and for the first time in my life, I was able to see something that I didn't see in the streets, something that I didn't see in the music industry, and it was a sense of brotherhood. I noticed everybody was smiling at each other, hugging each other, and I, I started to get more clients to want to know what they was upon. This brother gave me some literature of the 
religion of Islam, and he gave me the English translation of the Quran. The first day that I took the Quran home and I opened to read it and to read it, I knew for a fact right then that this cannot be written by a man. These cannot be the words of a man. Because I was around poets such as Tupac. Tupac was a genius when it comes to writing poetry. When I opened the Quran, I knew for a fact that a man could never come up with these words. Everything that I was searching for in my life, when I wanted to feel good, when I wanted happiness, I would turn to drugs. And I noticed that that was only temporary happiness. I would wake up sober. Allah says in the Quran, truly the hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah. Everything that we searching for in life, we have it in the book of Allah. I used to wonder how come I witnessed my mother and father get murdered in front of me? How come my friends like Tupac, Gaddafi, everybody, my brother, everybody around me was dying? Allah says in the Quran, every soul shall taste death. Everything that I was looking for in life. I knew that we had to worship a creator, but I never knew why did we worship a creator. The religion of Islam makes it clear why we should worship Allah alone. Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah not only is he the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we can just imagine all the affairs that Allah has to do every single day. If we just imagine that Allah is the one who makes the sun rises from the east and set in, set in the west. Allah is the one that provides for every creation, everything that's on the heavens and the earth that we know and don't know, Allah is the one that provides for it. Even if it's a fish or a creature in the sea that we don't even know exists, Allah is the one that provides for this creature every single day. Can you imagine that every single day we wake up, there is somebody somewhere in the world Allah is taking his soul. There is somebody somewhere in the world Allah is bringing to this life. There is someone that Allah is honoring. Allah is dishonoring. There is someone Allah is making rich. Allah is making poor. Allah might make it rain in Saudi Arabia. Or rain in New York City is 120 degrees in Saudi Arabia. Allah might make it snow in Alaska. And it might just be thunderstorming in Texas. This is not global warming. None of these activities happen without the permission of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, not a leaf falls without my knowledge. So the more that I read this, I knew for a fact that this is why Allah deserved to be worshipped alone. I was convinced. I was convinced that this was the true religion from the creator that was in the earth, no doubt about it. And alhamdulillah, I was able to accept the religion of Islam. After accepting the religion of Islam, Eventually, I was able to walk away from the music industry by the permission of Allah. What I do now is travel around the world as a motivational speaker. I'm not a scholar of the religion of Islam because I don't have no knowledge of the religion of Islam. I'm sure most of you kids and not all the kids are here. Y'all know more about the religion of Islam than me, so I'm not here to teach nobody about the religion. I'm here to learn. But one of the things I can do is remind you guys, and I can warn you about a lifestyle that many of us in America is running away from. One of the things I don't understand, we running away from an evil lifestyle. One of the things I don't understand is why, am I, why is our Muslim kids running towards that lifestyle? The lifestyle that we running away from, how come our Muslim youth is running towards that lifestyle? A lifestyle is calling you to the hellfire. And Allah says in the Quran that he's inviting us to Jannah. We have a religion of guidance. Why are we putting the Quran and Sunnah to the side and we putting the 50 cent CDs in our records? We putting the 50 cent CDs in our car and we think that this is our guidance. We listen to these gangster rappers. They tell us to call our women all types of names. They tell us to oppress ourselves and we listen to these fools. How come Allah says in the Quran we have a guidance from Allah and His Messenger? We have a way of life that if we live by, inshallah, if we die upon that, then we get to Jinnah. If you live by the life of these rappers and you die upon that, it's a big chance you go into the hellfire. None of us should want to gamble with our religion like that. None of us should want to be the Muslims that Allah replaces us with better Muslims. Because Allah doesn't need none of us in this mansion. If every single Muslim on the face of the earth never makes salat to Allah again, it doesn't hurt Allah one bit. The only one who would be the losers would be ourselves. If we stop making salat, it doesn't harm Allah. Allah doesn't need us. The only one who will fall at the loser would be ourselves. So it's very important, brothers, man, that you have, we have to realize that to be a Muslim is the, the greatest blessing on the face of the earth. Even if you had a house made out of gold, even if you had a billion dollars in your bank account, that's not a greater blessing to be a Muslim. It's many of people walking on the face of the earth and they got hearts hard as rocks. That they, the guidance of Islam cannot even penetrate their hearts 
because they got hearts as hard as rocks. And we, alhamdulillah, Allah guided us to this religion, and we messing around and we playing with our religion as if it's something we don't even care about. One of the things we have to start doing, brothers, is educating ourselves. Because alhamdulillah, we Muslim. Alhamdulillah, but that shouldn't be it. We should educate ourselves. Because there's only one way to practice this religion, that's according to the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the Sahabas. How many of us know who the Sahabas is? If we start asking some of the kids who are the Sahabas, we don't know it. But if you ask them who is David Beckham, everybody's hands go up. This is a sickness that plagued the Muslims, and I'm speaking to myself first. That we have role models other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran that, O oh, Muhammad, you are upon the exalted of character. Allah himself praised the character of the Prophet Muhammad. Why do we look for others as role models? Why do we look for others as role models? Why do you look for people like myself who converted to the religion of Islam? I'm not no role model. I'm just, I'm a Muslim and I'm in the same boat you are. I'm, I'm a sinner just like all you guys are sinners. Our role model was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahabas. Because these are the people that was granted paradise while they was living on earth. These are the people that we should be studying, we should want to know. Because these are the people that was granted gender while they was walking on earth. We living in a country right now. We living in a country that's a non-Muslim country. Do you know we will be held accountable for every person that we chase away from this religion of Islam? Do you know that if a person looked at us and he was afraid of us, that we would not get to gender? The Prophet said it. The Prophet said he does not believe, he does not believe, he does not believe. When some of the Sahaba said, oh messenger of Allah, who doesn't believe? He said, whoever has a neighbor, if this neighbor is afraid of the harm of that Muslim, he's not a believer. How many Muslims live in a Muslim country and our neighbors are afraid of us? How many of us live in a Muslim country and we believe because they're not Muslims we have to be rough to them and we have to be afraid? Man, that's a bad understanding of our religion. The Prophet Sallallahu said, do not go astray in your religion because that's what destroyed the people before you, the Christians and the Jews. Because they went astray in their religion. Most Muslims now, we think to make us a good Muslim, we got to scare the Kufar. To make you a good Muslim is save the life of a Kufar. Call them to the religion of Islam. Let them know that you should be wanting him to worship Allah alone just the way you worship Allah alone. It's very important, it's a hadith, that one of the Jewish kings at the time of Medina was dying. They went and called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a sahih hadith. This Jewish guy used to serve the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, oh Messenger of Allah, the young Jew, guy, Jew boy that used to serve you was on his deathbed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, good, he's a Catholic Jew, let him go to the hellfire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped everything he was doing. He went to the bedside of that little boy and he said, say, a shadow of la ilaha illallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had concern for the non-Muslims. He said, say a shadu wa la ilaha illallah. When the little Jewish boy looked at his father, the Jewish boy father said, obey Abu Qasim. The little boy took his shahada, he died a few seconds later. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got up and said, all praise due to Allah who saved that young boy from the hellfire through me. This is very important. We should have an attitude that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is the messenger of Allah, who are we? Who are we to be arrogant and say the hell with the Catholic and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He didn't have that type of attitude. We should know our deen. This is a religion of guidance. We should follow our desires. We follow we follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahabas. What about the people of Taif when they stoned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to blood was dripping in the sandals? The two angels came and said, "We are messengers from the Lord." And no messenger of Allah, Allah sent us. And if you tell me, and you give us the okay, we will crush the city of Taif between these two mountains. The Prophet said, Allah, they will sell it, they say, oh, they're a bunch of Kufar, Kafir, crush them. The Prophet said, Allah, they will sell it, said, no, show mercy to them. Because maybe one day in the future, people from their lineage will become Muslim. Look at the city of Taif right now in Saudi Arabia. It's a Muslim city, a Muslim country, alhamdulillah. This is very important, man. My son was a Kafir. I was a non-Muslim before. If it wasn't for the patience of a Muslim, if it wasn't for the patience of a Muslim, I would have probably died in a state of disbelief. But because that Muslim didn't look at me and say, he's a drunk, he's a gangster rapper, let him go to the hellfire, he was able to invite me to this religion of Islam. We don't own this religion. Just because you're born in Somalia, born in Arabia, born in Pakistan, born in India, the religion of Islam don't belong to nobody. This religion doesn't belong to none of us. This religion, Allah says in the Quran, could they call the people to 
worship me alone. Allah says this in the Quran. Where are we from that? How come we want to take this religion and use it as a gangster religion? And say we don't want to call nobody, we just want to destroy everybody. This is not what the religion of Islam teaches. This is a religion, man, that teaches, that calls for peace. This is a religion that calls for peace. Even though we have jihad in our religion, no doubt under circumstances. Even though we have fighting in the way of Allah, no doubt under circumstances. But Allah also said, call these people to that, call these people to Jannah. Allah says in the Quran, whoever take the life of one person unjust is as if he killed the whole of humanity. We accept the whole of the religion of Islam. It's very easy to chase a person away. But we should be the ones that look at an individual and say, SubhanAllah. I want to invite that individual to the religion of Islam. I want to call this person to the religion of Islam. Know why? Because that be one other person in this dunya worshiping Allah alone. If you truly love this religion, you would not want people to worship Allah with a partners. You should not want people to associate partners with Allah. We want everybody to worship Allah alone, correct? Because this religion doesn't belong to us. So this is why it's very important, brothers and, brothers and sisters, that we learn our religion. We learn our religion by the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Salaf, the early predecessors of Islam. And the first one was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said to Fatima and Sahih Bukhari, oh Fatima, I am a blessed Salaf to you. He was our first Salaf, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Sahabas, then the Tabi'een and the Tabi'i Tabi'een. These are our role models. How did they dealt with this society? How did they treat this religion of Islam? These were the people, man, who treated this religion of Islam because they knew it was the Haq. Allah says in the Quran, whoever opposed a messenger and follow a way other than the way of the Sahab, of the believers, we would leave them what they apart and we would land them in the hellfire. What an evil destination. Even the best read in the end he said when Allah mentioned the word believers in that verse, he would talk about us as Sahabas. How far are we away from the Sahabas? When Allah says in the Quran, whoever follow a way other than the way of the Sahabas, we're going to leave them what they upon. They might think they're on the hop. They might think they're doing something correct. They might think they're doing something right. Not, we don't pick from the Sahabas. We don't pick what we want to pick from the Sahabas. We don't say we're just going to follow the Sahabas and this and that. No, we follow the Sahabas because they had the right Aqidah, the right manhash, because the teacher was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We take everything, we take the understanding of the Sahabas. Even the best said when Allah mentioned believers in that verse, he was talking about us as Sahabas. Many verses in the Quran when Allah mentioned believers, he was only talking to the Sahabas. When Allah said, oh Muhammad, I am pleased with you and the believers when they took the pledge under the tree. He was talking about the Sahabas. And the Sahabas, mashallah, they was men. They knew their religion. They represented the religion world. They represent the religion world. The Tabi'een, they went all around the world. It was Arabs, it was Arab traders who went to countries like Africa, countries like Indonesia, who spread the religion of Islam, who called the people away from the hellfire. So it's very important, brothers, man, that we realize that this gangster image that the shaitan is portraying on the television, that's a false image. And unfortunately, our youth are being, missu being swayed away by this image. You only see five minutes of these people on television. You don't see when the cameras say cut and most of them go in their home and they crying every single night because they don't know where to turn to. As Muslims, man, we know where to turn to. When things get rough for us, when things go bad for us, we say, well, maybe I've been committing too many sins, let me go do Tawbah. When things get rough, we turn to Allah. We have guidance. So it's very important, man, that we realize that this is a nikmah from Allah to be a Muslim. This is a nikmah from Allah to be on the Quran and the Sunnah. This is very important. And do not let Allah snatch this away from us. We pray and we ask Allah that we die upon this religion. Because it's very important to be a Muslim, but the most important thing is to die upon this religion. And we want to be glad, we want to be good bearers of this religion. When somebody sees us walking down the street with a beard and a throat, we shouldn't want the people to say, oh, let us run away, they might blow themselves up. We shouldn't want the people to say, I'm afraid that they might blow themselves up. When the Prophet said, whoever killed himself, he's in the hellfire. He said, whoever kills himself, he didn't say, but you could kill yourself this way, but you should kill yourself this way. The brothers and the scholars said in the Arabic language, the Prophet said, whoever killed themselves, no matter what, they're going to the hellfire. This is why we needed to know our religion. This is why we need to know what the Prophet and his Sahabas was upon. Because Allah chose these people to aid the Prophet and his And these people were the best generation of mankind. And we follow our religion the way they follow their religion. So it's very important, man, that the religion of Islam is a middle religion. The religion of Islam is not a religion where you look like a gangster and walk down the street. Everybody want to be Umar and be Katad nowadays. Everybody want to be Umar. Umar was the one that weeped the most from Allah's messenger. You want to be Umar, but Umar cried that night. 
You wanted to be Umar, but Umar was merciful. It's a time in the hadith when the Umar already let Andrew see some people from Taif talking loud in the Prophet Majid. Umar had wisdom. He went up to him and said, where are you from? They said, we from Taif. He said, oh, because if you was from Medina, the city of knowledge, and you had knowledge, then you would have had a problem with me. But being that you from another city, I'm going to let it slide. But everybody want to be Umar. We want to be harsh amongst each other because we want the people to say, wow, mashallah, he loves religion. He's like Umar ibn Qatab. But we don't want to weep like Umar ibn Qatab. Everybody want to be Umar. Everybody want to be harsh so the people can look at us and say, mashallah, look at that good Muslim. He's very harsh. Allah says in the Quran, oh, Muhammad, if you was harsh with the people, you would have chased the people away. We need to know our religion, man. We need to know that the religion of Islam is a middle way. And also the Sahabas, the scholars said the Sahabas was the people that with their head down all day, also looking like they said, mashallah, humble, so that the people would say, wow, the Sahabas was men. They was in the middle. These are the people with one of the Sahabas said, when Allah created the human beings, from the best of the human beings, he made them prophets. When he took from the prophets, from the best of the prophets, he chose the prophets, some alive that would sell them, to be the one with the final revelation. And from the rest of the human beings, Allah chose the best of the human beings from the beginning of time to the day of judgment, the best of the human beings, and he made them the Sahabas. The best of mankind that Allah chose, he made them the Sahabas. And the Sahabas were from Arabia, from Africa, from Persia, from Roman. These were the people that Allah chose to be with the Prophet Wasallam. So these are the people we take as our role models. Not David Beckham, not Tupac, not these gangster rappers that's calling to the hellfire who don't have no guidance themselves. We ask a lot to guide them to the religion they serve. These are the people. The people that got gender while they was living. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the prophet Salah that was selling looking at you and say, Abu Bakr going to Jinnah, Umar bin Qatab going to Jinnah, Abdul Rahman ibn Oaf going to Jinnah. These people was living when the prophet Salah that was selling said, Bilal going to Jinnah. He said, he said the Sahabas was going to Jinnah. Guess what the Sahabas did? They didn't puff their chest up and say, I'm doing I'm going to Jinnah, let me get back. To the point that when Umar bin Qatab went to Hudayfa, when Hudayfa told Umar not to make, do not pray over this hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. Allah's messenger said he's a hypocrite. Umar bin Qatab pulled him to the side and said, I'm going to ask you this one time, but Allah, you better tell me the truth. Did the Prophet said, I'm one of the hypocrites? This is Umar bin Qatab ready to handle him. Verses of the Quran got revealed because of Umar. Who are we? We walking around as if we know we going to Jinnah. Who are we? These are the Sahabas that didn't play what they did. How do we even know our deeds are being accepted? How many know our deeds are being accepted? We live in life as if we know we going to Jinnah. Man, we should humble ourselves and I'm speaking to myself first. Because this is a religion of mercy, man. And Allah guided us to this religion. And we don't want to be the ones that wake up on the Yama Kiyama bankrupt. We wake up on the day of judgment bankrupt because we didn't want for our brothers what we wanted for ourselves. Because we envy one, each other, one another. Because we was neglectful of our prayers. Because we did so many good deeds for sure that on the day of judgment we can raise up with nothing in our bank account. We don't want to gamble like that. If the Sahabas was humble and they didn't play with their thing like that, who are we? Did you wonder why out of every four people on the planet, out of, out of, one out of every four people on the planet is a Muslim. But look at our state right now. Look at the Muslim Ummah, look at our state. You can't always blame the Jews or the Christians. We can't always blame everybody else. Allah says in the Quran, whatever evil befalls you is for what your own deeds do. Did we ever think that the Muslims around the world is punished because of some sins that we can even be doing here in, in Britain? Did we ever think like that? Because there was a narration with one of the Sahabas, he was with the Tabi'een. And they just conquered Cyprus. And the Sahaba was, the Sahaba was looking down, looking depressed. The Tabi'i said, why are you depressed? Allah just opened up Cyprus for us. Why are you depressed? The Sahaba who had insight said, do you see the way these women is running around in disarray? And how we put the sword to the neck of the husbands and the kids are crying. He said, the reason why I'm looking like this is because it's going to be a time that the same thing is going to happen to the Muslims. He said, it's going to come a time that the Muslims are going to turn their back on their religion and they're going to be engaged in so much sin that Allah is going to do this to us. But we run around blaming everybody. Let's blame the Jews. Let's blame the Christians. When Allah says in the Quran, whatever evil befalls you, it's for what your own hands put for. Let's start blaming ourselves. Let's start blaming ourselves. Let's start saying that we wake up for Fajr. Are we making our fast a lot? Are we bumping gangster music instead of the Quran? Are we harsh? Are we just jihad, 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 but we don't want to do what the Sahabas did? 
before the Sahabas and any jihad, they learn to heed first. Are we the ones saying before the Sahabas, before Sahabas ever done that, they learned their religion. They was merciful people. Why we don't want to be like the Sahabas? Why we want to be, why we want to take from the religion but don't take from the other part of the religion? What's wrong with us that we got to that point? Don't be extreme in our religion, man. The reason why I keep repeating that, because I never seen more extremism in my life than until I came to Britain. Well, lie. Well, lie. I didn't see this stuff in America. I didn't see this stuff in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia. I didn't see that stuff until I came here amongst the youth. You see so many youth, they want to fight, they want to fight. They, what about fighting the evil within ourselves? What about fighting the evils without, how are you going to defeat an enemy when you can't even stop listening to music? You can't even stop smoking marijuana at night. You can't even stop drinking alcohol. You can't even call people to the religion of Islam, but you want to destroy people. Listen, man, we have to return back to our religion the proper way. We have guidance. And the best guidance is that of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the understanding of his Sahabas. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I'm leaving you with two things. And if you hold on to these two things, you will never go astray. That's the Quran and the Sunnah. Many people want to say because they wanted to interpret the Sahaba, they want to interpret the Quran according to their own desires. When you come to them and say, no, but the Sahabas did this, they say, no, it's 2010, we mean this. Many people got led astray because they interpreted, because they didn't want to follow the Sunnah. They didn't want to follow the Sunnah. The Prophet said it would be a man, and he would be sitting on his couch, and somebody would bring a narration among us. And this individual would say, I don't want to hear the narration. I only want to follow the, the Quran. The Quran is from Allah. I only want the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu said, destruction to that man. Destruction to that man, destruction to that man. The Prophet Sallallahu said, they eat the flesh of a donkey is haram. But do you see that in the Quran? These are the words of the Prophet. No Muslim will go eat a donkey. But that verse is not in the Quran. You can't open the Quran and see the meat, the flesh of a donkey's head on. This is from the Sunnah of the Prophet said Allah, they were set up. And the Prophet said, do not go extreme in your religion, because that's what destroyed the people before us. And the Prophet said Allah, they were set up, said there would come a time when Allah would take the righteous scholars away, and the people who are ignorant would be misleading the youth away. So it's very important, brothers. If we want to learn our deen, return back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Imam Malik said, what break the father earlier generations of Muslims? It's what's going to rectify the later generation of Muslims, and that's Tawheed. Jazakallah khair for your time. I guess we can go to any questions and answers after this. Barakallah fi. Brothers, I'm the eldest. Assalamualaikum uh, Our brothers visit us from America, and you can listen to him what, the way he gives us advice and ideas. Inshallah, you can ask him any question you want, and the question will be, guiding for what you think he can answer. Not every question for someone make it difficult. <coughs> just, um, um, not everybody in this room is Muslim at the moment, so I just wanted to ask you what advice would you give as some of us who have guests here, so what advice would you give to them in regards to searching about Islam and the truth to deal about Islam? Subhanallah. Um, basically, the advice I can give is that I was once in that state, you know what I mean, so I know what they're going through. One of the things, for example, we, most people, we agree that it's a creator. Most people would see that somebody put the sun in the sky, somebody put the moon in the sky. You cannot blame it on science because the scientists cannot even go near to the sun. They don't even know what the sun is truly made out of because of the heat and the gas. They would not even know what's up there. So it's very important that even if we think of the basics, who created all this? Who put the sun in the sky? Who created the trees? Who makes it rain? This is some normal question that we should ask ourselves. Why are we created? Everything that you look at and is doing it, it has a purpose. Even the thumb, for example. Many people don't have a thumb. It would be hard for them to even grip, any, grip things. Even the hair that's in your nostrils. For example, most people, if you don't have hair in your nostrils, all types of bacteria can get up your nose. Everything has a purpose. Therefore, we should know that we have a purpose in life. And our purpose in life is greater than just eating and partying. And we should know that we got to return to somewhere. For example, you have babies that's born. They would, live on, they would live for five minutes and they would die. Do you think that, for example, that's it? They have no other life? This, this mother just puts nine months, carried this baby for nine months, the baby came, died five minutes later, his life is over? There's so many questions we should ask ourselves. And this is where the religion of Islam has these answers. 
No other religion had the answers. And it's not saying this out of arrogance. We say this because this is the truth. Allah is our creator. He the one created all of us. We all have to return to Allah. Allah doesn't ask us for anything. Something very simple is to worship Him alone. For example, your mother's raises. Most of the people here probably got a mother that raised them. Imagine growing up after your mother raised you, fed you, breastfed you, changed your diapers. All of a sudden you become a grown man and now you want to call another woman mommy. That would be very offensive to your mother. What about the creator of the heavens and the earth who fed us, protected us, who helped us form in the rooms of our mother and now we grow up and we call someone else God. So this is very important, man, that the religion of Islam, it doesn't call to a person to worship a tree. It doesn't call a person to worship any human being. We don't worship Muhammad. It doesn't call a person to worship animals, idols. It calls you to worship the creator of everything. The creator who created Adam. The one who created Adam out of mud. The one who created his wife from his ribs. The one who made countless generations of men. And God so merciful that he sent us many prophets and messengers to call us back to worship him alone. So some people might say, well, what about, I'm a good person. I don't need to follow the religion they say. I believe in God, and I'm going to live my life according to good morals. According to good morals, to what standards? You got people in America that they believe good morals is that they can basically, they believe good morals is drinking every Friday. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm getting drunk only on the weekends. Some people believe good morals that go around, they have all types of standards of what they think is good. So who, who's better to teach us what's good than God? The creator of the heavens and the earth because he knows what's best for us. I know some people that say, man, I'm a good person. I only smoke three blunts of marijuana a day. I'm not hurting anybody. But he's destroying himself. So when God says this is wrong, it's not to say it's wrong just to make things hard. At the end, that person destroys body. So it's very important to know that in order for us to follow a way, it would be the best way that our creator told us to live. And Allah, all he asks is for us is to worship him alone. And he said, simple as that. If you worship me alone and don't associate no partners with me, if you die upon that, you will be in heaven forever. And when you get to heaven, everything that your soul could desire, imagine living on earth, everything your soul could desire, you will have up in heaven. It will never, ever end. And if you just die upon associate partners with Allah, he said that you will be in a hellfire forever, eternally. Can you imagine living in a hellfire, being roasted by a fire forever? So it's very simple, man, that our religion of Islam only calls us to the worship of the Creator. We not, he's not asking for nothing but his rights because he's our Creator. And I would say if there's any person that's saying that's a non-Muslim, one of the things I hear a lot of people in America say, I don't want to become a Muslim man because it's too hard, I like to drink, I like to party. Okay, you can do all that. We're not saying that there's something good about that, but do all that. Because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, he didn't start off with stop drinking, stop smoking, stop partying. He called the people to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth alone. And then when the faith entered the heart, you will leave that stuff alone on your own. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said at the beginning, if Islam would have came and said drinking alcohol was haram, having fornication was haram, she said nobody would have became a Muslim. So we're not telling you to do all that. All we're telling you to do what Allah is telling you to do, worship Him alone. Everything else will fall in its natural place. This is a religion of ease. This is a religion where it's not asking nothing from you. You don't have to pay no money every month. You don't have to get, if we're not asking anything from you, man, you will save yourself from the hellfire by accepting the religion of Islam. So if there's anybody over here, man, and if you have some type of questions of the religion of Islam, I'm sure many of the people can help you. If, you. if you're thinking about your life, and if you're concerned and you love your life, then this is a chance that Allah brought you here tonight, not by accident. Everything happened for a reason. It was written that Allah brought you in this room. Hopefully we can clarify what the religion of Islam is so that you can accept this religion. And if there's anybody here, this is your day, inshallah. Once you accept the religion of Islam, the Prophet said, all your sins are forgiven. You're like a newborn baby. No matter what you've done in your past, your sins are forgiven. Any other questions, brothers? Stand up.